Hello, and welcome to Season 3 of Beyond Teaching, a series featured on the Psych Sessions Network. This series is hosted by Susan Nolan from Seton Hall University, Adyinka Akinsular smith from City College of New York, City University of New York, Asani Sewell from Pacific University, and yours truly, Eric Landrum from Boise State University. To be a successful psychology academic or professional, it takes more than teaching research or clinical skills. That is, today's professionals were probably not taught everything they need to know in graduate school. The Psych Sessions podcast, Beyond Teaching, strives to fill that gap. We chat about the topics we need to know about to be successful in our careers, but we didn't know to ask about in graduate school. When we don't have the expertise among us, we go out and find someone. And this is particularly relevant in Season 3. These 10 episodes were recorded from June 7th through November 2nd, 2021, and they are being released starting December 29th, 2021, and Season 3 will finish on March 30th, 2022. What are you in for? Oh, the places we'll go. We'll chat about leveraging social media, publications, and playing that classic academic game, how to make decisions about co-authoring, dealing with student requests for accommodations and exceptions, which seems especially relevant in this era, and maximizing student office hours, or what are called student hours these days. Also in Season 3, we invited a number of guests to come on the podcast and share their expertise with us. This included Sun Yung Lee in Saikai's Faculty Support Advisory Committee and what Saikai can do for faculty, Loretta McGregor and the difference between mentoring and advising, with extra information about imposter phenomenon tossed in for good measure. Sandy Jenkins and James Lane share their experience from two accumulated careers about clinical supervision. And Beatrice Krauss shares her delightful adventures in retirement, which depart greatly from our retirement stereotypes or typical tropes. We truly hope that you'll enjoy season three of Beyond Teaching. Well, welcome back to another episode of Beyond Teaching, and we are beyond thrilled to have a special guest with us today that our colleague Yinka has invited. So, Yinka, why don't I let you do the introductions? So, I had the absolute pleasure of meeting Dr. Beatrice Krauss in 2008. I happened to have applied for and been awarded uh, a fellowship. She was leading a research in HIV intervention skills for the community project that was funded through NIMH. And I wound up being one of the fellows. Little did I know how that experience was going to change the direction of my research. Now, B has been an incredible mentor. She She's led over, and I'm just going to kind of highlight some of the things on her LinkedIn page. She's led over 40 privately city, state, nationally, or internationally funded HIV research projects. She has published on HIV prevention and adjustment to HIV in highly affected communities. She's received numerous awards. Be's a psychologist. She plays the harp. She just had her most recent uh, book of poetry come out. Uh, this is all, by the way, in her retirement. She picked up and moved, left us in New York City and moved to Arizona. So, and above all, she's a mentor who has retired. And clearly, when I think of retirement, I'm thinking lying on a beach somewhere, I don't know, sipping something nice, peeling, having peeled grapes fed to me or something. But B has not stopped. She has just been going. And when we think about Beyond Teaching and all the many facets, one of the things that I've always wondered about is, so when psychology people in the field retire, what do they do? And does so much. And she's a fantastic, amazing mentor, has always been. 
and a good friend. So I, that's who we have with us today. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. I am proud to be joining you. And uh, we have to turn the tables because anyone who has taught knows that you learn as much from the people that you mentor and teach as you do from teaching and mentoring them. So it's always a two-way street. Well, Susan here, I'm really excited that you're here. And when Nika suggested inviting you, she really wanted, among other things, to talk about what it's like to be officially retired and yet to have such a full professional life afterwards. And I'd love to hear you talk about what you're doing in your quote unquote retirement and get a sense that might help our listeners to envision what life is going to be like professionally beyond the official retirement. Okay. Well, th that's really interesting. When Herb and I moved here, a gentleman who had taught at Penn State where Herb had gone to, Herb was my husband, had gone uh, to college. And then at Northwestern, where I had gone to college, was in the psychology department at University of Arizona. Now, you may have heard that there's six degrees of separation between you and anybody else. To be accurate, it's seven for the planet. It's five for the United States and it's two for Arizona. <laughs> it seems like everybody is connected to everybody. So Lee invited us to join a group that he had founded called EGAD, the Evaluation Group for Addressing Data. And they were really in the consultative status to everybody in other countries, in the community, on the faculty and students. Etc. As a matter of fact, Yinka will appreciate this. Sonia Gonzalez, one of the other fellows, we gave her advice on her, her dissertation via Zoom. And so that, of course, got me a little bit started. Then I, I started playing harp and I had a very nice harp teacher. And she said, There is a local hospice. And someone just retired playing for patients. So I started playing for patients and going to staff meetings. And they started to have a project on non-pharmaceutical interventions for persons with dementia and behavioral, problematic behavior, agitation, anxiety, et cetera. And the non-pharmaceutical interventions consisted of weighted blankets, a, a lap toy sort of thing that was distracting, music, et cetera. And, and they wanted to publish on this. Guess what? <laughs> so I wound up helping them. And, and one of my most recent publications is a pilot study of non-pharmaceutical interventions. And so I did this under the auspices of EGAD, but also as a harpist at Casa de la Luz, a hospice. So you're getting the idea of these funny connections, and they just do. The other thing I got very interested in was, my goodness, we're in Tucson. The sun shines, but there isn't any rain. So I have two giant water tanks, each 1,500 gallons. And got involved with watershed management and we have solar panels on my house, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. So you meet all sorts of people doing these things. And if you let them know a little bit about your capabilities, one thing leads to another. Now, the oddest thing that happened is there was someone in public health named Hernima Madhavan. And because of ECAD and somebody who had consulted with ECAD in the, the past, she came and she wanted to talk about working with the Pima County Department of Health on the anti-vaccination problem. Well, she emailed me. I somehow missed of uh, the email. So I went searching for my emails and found out that one of my son's very best friends was introducing the two of us because she learned that Pranima had just moved to University of Arizona. 
So we had this intermediate friend, Maria Hernandez, and then, of course, I got pulled in to all of Pranima's research. Now, Pranima also does research in India, and uh, she has several small villages there that she's working with, but she is very grounded. So when we were doing our how do you address a vaccine hesitancy, she's working with the Pranima uh, with the Pima County Department of Health. She was working with uh, Native American tribes. She was working with churches. This will all sound very familiar to Yenka, right? That you've got to get on the ground. You've got to have a community representation. You have to have your client population represented in an advisory board or you're cooked. So I am about to talk to our new organizer to get Mark Kelly back on the ballot and show that Arizona turning blue was not a fluke in 2020, and that indeed Arizona has turned blue. Now, he grew up on the Upper West Side. He got a political science degree from Skidmore. He's here now. And he sent me out to canvas 40 houses in two hours. <laughs> we don't have high rises with apartments next door to each other. So we're about to have a conversation about how you have to have on the ground knowledge. And the particular neighborhood that he sent me into, I had driven by it a thousand times. But when you're on the ground, it's a very different neighborhood and there's a reason there are all those large dogs and all of those <laughs> lock gates etc and I did see a drug deal going down <laughs> so my my experience back in New York was very helpful because we could observe that very clearly in our work on the Lower East Side so I could have a conversation with him about you have to have community knowledge. So B, when do you think you're going to retire? Thank you. <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking, where are the bonbons? Where's the fancy drink? The sweatpants. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking um, that this is a remarkable testament to the uh, flexibility of a psychology background. Because you have just listed about 10 different things that your psychology background pertains to. And I think the idea of sort of psychological literacy slash global citizenship writ large, what you've done is you've taken the professional background and you've inserted it into all these different parts of your post-retirement life. It's really exciting. Yes. Now, now as to the font, okay, my darling husband passed away in September of 2016. And he was really good about, you got to have a balanced life. I don't know how he did it. He had over seven books. He had a hundred publications, but he always managed to have fun. And he kept reminding me there were Italian Nobel Prize winners who did a lot of their work after their two-hour lunches talking with their buddies. And that a lot happens in those conversations, talking with your friend. Don Campbell was one of my mentors. He was a huge believer in reading outside of your discipline. Read anthropology, read economics, read all sorts of things, read mysteries. You got to get outside of your discipline to get a, a broader perspective. So Herb was really good at having fun. He would do things like, Oh, there's a sign, Globe 100 miles. We've never been to Globe. Let's go. And we had dogs at that point in our life, and they got you out the door. They got you walking in all the parks, et cetera. So what I am doing now is relearning Herb's lessons. So I have tea at 2 on Tuesdays with seven high school friends who are all over the country in all different backgrounds. And then I do have a guest bedroom and my cousins from Alaska come through and I'm supposed to go to Alaska when things open up with my grandson. And 
my clinical psychologist son in Claremont, California, is very good. Be or mom, people are asking you to do things. What do you want? And so my Alaska cousins gave me lots of lessons. They travel a lot, but what they travel to do is to see former students and friends. That's lovely. Yeah. 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 So lovely. And yes, and he's done. My Alaska cousin-in-law has done that 600 mile trail in between Spain and France, the Camino something or other. I've heard about it. Yeah. And he's a very gregarious person. So he meets people on these trips and, and he used to run the Alaska State Fair. He finds out that they have some kind of interesting ability and he invites them to perform at the Alaska State Fair. So he's very gregarious. Now, my eldest son, Michael, who is in New York, when her passed away, he said, Mom, you always danced, but Dad didn't dance. And he said, I'm into tango and I'm coming to the Tucson Tango Festival and my instructors are performing. So I'm going to sneak you in to see their performance. Well, that was Anna Padron and Diego. And they had, before they moved apart, but it still is in existence, an organization called Tango for All. Tango for All does performances at Montefiore for people who are sitting there getting their uh, chemotherapy. It does tango teaching for blind kids in Miami before they moved to New York. In New York, they did tango for people with Parkinson's because you have a partner and you have some support and you have rhythm movement. So I wrote a grant for them to do tango inside of lower Manhattan art galleries to bring more people into the art galleries. And I have the most wonderful picture. They couldn't show patience, but the most wonderful picture of Diego dancing and in the background, a nurse going like this. Ta-da. So I guess I get hooked by good people. And I have to tell you, I taught at Hunter, but the tango community is the most diverse community I have ever been affiliated with. I've danced with a blacksmith. I've danced with someone who was transitioning from male to female. And I was so well, who's going to lead? And she said, I draw the line at high heels. <laughs> And so she did the leading. I danced uh, with people from all over the world because what happens with tango is if someone is passing through, they look on their iPhone to see where there's a dance party and they just show up. So there's actually Tinder for tango. Yeah. You can swipe right or left for a tango partner. Yeah, yeah, you just show up and the guys, there's always more women than there are men. So the guys are always in good shape. And yeah, it's just starting up again. The New York Times had a a big article about the tango scene in New York reviving. And my son has taken lessons for years and everybody knows him. So he's my entree. So I've actually danced with some excellent people who say, oh, you're Mike's mom. So I'm sort of in the tango community known as the mother of Mike from New York. (laughs) This is Asani B. I just love hearing all this. It's just like making my heart sing so much. And I just love how all the work that you've gotten involved is an extension of who you are and what you've believed in. And you've kind of made it all your life work. It's so exciting to think about that that could be a possibility for retirement life after academia. I wonder, B, what was your transition like into being retired? I mean, it's hard to sort of piece apart the moment when that happened because you've continued much of your work into your quote-unquote retired life. But 
What, was there any piece of it that felt difficult or joyous or just what was that, those moments like when you're transitioning from full-time um, work to being retired? It felt odd because I was used to getting up in the morning, getting on the train, going into Grand Central, walking to whatever office I happened to have at that time, multiple projects going on. And I thought at first it was all going to be, oh, now I can make all the scrapbooks. Now I can get rid of the 8,000 emails that are lingering on my account. None of that's happened. It, it, it was like, okay, I'm going to go to the desert museum and learn to make candy out of, out of a uh, prickly pear cactus. I did that. But sooner or later, you wound up meeting people and they're talking about what you, quote, used to do. And all of a sudden, you have skills that they need, plus which Yinka is right. I, I am still writing letters of recommendation. I'm still looking at people's articles before they send them in. I'm still looking at grant proposals before people I'm still see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm cheery because the great thing about any kind of teaching is you yourself can't do everything. But if you empower other people, my goodness, what they're able to accomplish, Shinka being your case, in, and it's like throwing out seeds and they're going to sprout all over the place and it's past you. But again, it's, I think it's all about the fact that we're all interconnected and it's fun. I hate to say it, but finding out that Anna and Diego, and I'm going to send Adyinka some YouTube, a couple of my favorite YouTube tango performances. Please do. One by Anna and Diego and one by Luis Bianchi and his wife, Daniela Pucci, who didn't like the scene in Boston for tango when she was teaching mathematics at MIT, so she just said, I'm going to a different university. And she did, just like that. So there are all kinds of reasons for leaving. Yeah. You might not like the deep dish beats in Chicago, and you might want the bin stuff in New York. You never know. Yeah, and there was something about the... Sonoran Desert, which is very unusual. It's the only place where you have those that look like that with their arms up as if they are praying. And they look when they bloom as if they're about to give you a bouquet. And my husband found that very spiritual. We got to, uh, to Tucson because my son Daniel had gotten a joint law psychology degree here and he'd met a young woman and we had to meet her. And we just loved the notion of day tripping, which you can really do from here and be in very interesting places. And I've gone with my grandchildren to Mesa Verde and to one of them was very adventurous. And so we went to Colorado to, I got to remember that we went to Durango and outside of Durango is the most beautiful place in the world to go zip lining. <laughs> so you go be at what age did you go zip lining? May I ask, please? Just a couple of years ago. Oh, of course. Yep. I, I'm 77. Okay. But yep. I, I mean, you, for me, one of the things that's been so incredible listening to your stories and knowing you is just, yes, you've, you've, done, you've contributed again in other realms, your skills, the writing, the research, the publishing, but you've also done new things. For example, I'm just thinking about your book of poetry. Poetry been something you'd been writing all along? Or was this again, another a foray into a new realm for you? Okay. I had always written poetry. 
ever since I was a little girl. And I had taken workshops in New York. I had taken two or three. Herb always encouraged me to write more poetry. I took some workshops at the Poetry Center here. But the book was from the Tango community. When COVID hit, they founded a little Facebook site called I'm Not Dancing Tango, I'm Doing This. And one of the individuals I had danced with, a young man, my son's age, very nice guy, said, oh, I'm giving a poetry workshop. So I went online, took his poetry workshop. Lo and behold, he had an MFA from Trinity College in Dublin. And he was a very serious poet. And he had just founded a press and he had already published three books. And after the poetry workshop, he said, can you send me 10, 10 poems? And I did. Then he said, can you send me 40? And I sent 40 and he said, this is in, that's out. This goes together. This is a good order. Do you really want a period here? Or should this entire poem be without any punctuation? And he was the publisher of the book. Again, it's that it was just like a miracle. It was just happenstance. Okay. I, B, B, I've, I've just met you and I want to be trippingly polite to you, but no miracle occurred. No, no miracle occurred. You didn't happen to just accidentally write 40 poems in the middle <laughs> of the night. You didn't accidentally use your powers of extroversion to meet people and talk to people. You, you may have been blessed in your life, but you've worked, it's clear that you've worked incredibly hard and given your heart and soul to areas of research that had to be painstaking and heartbreaking at times. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. And the biggest heartbreak is what I, one of the projects I'm doing right now. My husband died September 2nd of 2016, and he didn't get the correct diagnosis until he was in hospice. Okay. And he got it from the hospice physician who said several of your relatives, your son and grandson have celiac disease. I'm sure that this is lymphoma. There's a form of lymphoma that is related to ce celiac disease, but others that are not. I recommend that you do an autopsy. And it turned out to be the form that was not. So you could imagine the relief of my son and grants. Of course. And of course, there's all this work from Tversky and Kahneman on cognitive bias. And it got picked up. They had one fellow who was a physician in Canada and it got picked up by the Canadians. And what happened with my poor husband is they kept misattributing his symptoms to his age. They did not know him so that they presumed that the fatigue was because he was 76. And before he died, Herb said to me, do something about this. And so I have a scoping review of the literature going on um, cognitive bias in medical diagnosis. So I, I want to I want to respect that serious contribution. I I think the word retirement. I think we need more versions of it because I I don't think you're retired with all due respect. No, I think retirement has a stereotype of what Yink has been referring to, whether it's bonbons on the beach or the one I'm fearful of, a retirement home or assistant mm -hmm. living. And B, sure, if, if everyone gets to retire like you do, sign me up because you are the living poster person of what retirement should be in the United States. Well, and I do know how to have fun. For my 75th birthday, my younger son said, what? would a, a short dream vacation be? I said, the beach in Oregon where I grew up and up into the mountains, Havsy Havsy. And that's exactly what we did. And November, whatever the Thursday is, the first Thursday in November, 
I'm driving off to the Albuquerque a Tango Festival, which is very controlled. Everybody has to have been vaccinated. Masks have to be worn. And my son, Michael from New York, Mike from New York. Oh, the Mike is from New York. That's right. Yeah, is flying in to go to the same Tango Festival. And the poetry editor will be there too. Community B. So, I'm sorry, does Hamsey Hamsey mean you're splitting the... Hamsey, Hamsey, in, in terms of that particular vacation, I was sitting, I love the mountains, I love the beach, I love the mountains. Oh, yeah. And so we... Uh, rented places both at the beach and, and in the mountains and we had a wonderful time i was gonna say it sounded like those boys are doing pretty well they should be paying everything for their mom <laughs> yeah yeah and my grandchildren my sons and the and my daughters in law all have great senses of humor oh it's lovely yeah just terrific senses of humor i have a picture well it's a video that I cannot post because I am sworn to secrecy of, I got each family a pinata of one of our former presidents with orange hair. Hmm. Who would that be? Yeah. And remain nameless. Yes. And they each showed what they decided to do with it. And one of them is my youngest grandson with the most beautiful form you've ever seen in your life. Hitting the pinata out of the park. A Louisville slugger. Yes, exactly. But it's T-ball, the teensy spin on whatever. He, and they did it in slow-mo. <laughs> <laughs> so you got the full effect. I got the full effect. And with the crowd cheering. Mm. I don't know how they did it, but they have these wonderful senses of humor. Oh, it's great. B, you were, I, I wrote down something word verbatim that you said earlier on, and I know Yink is writing down serious questions. I'll let her get to those in a moment. Uh, quote, then I started playing harp. Could you think about that? I mean, no one, no, I don't know people who go to the harp store and pick up a harp and take it home in the harp backpack and to start playing. My, uh, one of my sisters is a, uh, a guidance counselor and she uses me as an example of the winding paths that life can take. When I was 13 years old, there was a very popular band and orchestra leader at Grant High School in Portland, Oregon called Harold Jeans, and he wanted to play La Fiesta Mexicana in a band contest, but it required a harp. So my flute playing sister and my clarinet playing brother came home and demanded that I learn to play the harp. So that did happen, and my harp teacher in Portland, again, became a, a lifelong mentor. She was just wonderful. So I also was into journalism. I went off to college. My first major was journalism, and for the first year, we didn't write anything, and I was getting very furious. And so the music students were playing all over the place. Some of them were choir directors of local churches. And so I started playing harp with them. I transferred over to music. I met my husband. He said, Don Campbell's at Northwestern. You should really take a class from him. And when I took a class from him, it was like the world opening up. Mm. So I graduated. I have an undergraduate degree in harp. And then I went on in psychology. And the epitome of my harp playing was when we were at University of Georgia and the Atlanta Symphony needed a second harpist. I played second harp in the Atlanta Symphony for a year. And here, if you're going to play harp at hospice, you don't want to drag around the concert harp. No, no, no. I have a little. I have a little made in Pennsylvania. I have a little troubadour harp that you could strap on and walk around and play. You know, with psych sessions, we've done maybe about 130 interviews and we often ask people what their undergraduate major was. I have to say, B, you're the first person who's ever said I had an undergraduate degree in harp. Yes. 
very rare indeed. I'm going to give Yinka a chance. I'm going to stop because I, I could keep going. Queen. Yeah, I, I mean, I I guess my my the one question I'm going to ask for, and this is more for our listeners, and you've given us many examples, but what would you say be are the top things that people should think about when they start looking to retire? You could plan a little bit, but life is going to surprise you. And go with things that just make your heart sing. Writing that little grant for Anna and Diego so they could dance in art galleries. I mean, that just makes your heart sing. Mm. Um, getting a Tucson Medical Center. Oh, this is terrible. This is social psychology writ large. After Herb passed away, I wrote to them and said, you really have to do a training about cognitive bias and medical diagnosis. And they kept pushing me off and pushing me off. Well, I got invited to go to the evaluation conference, the American Evaluation uh, Society conference, and it happened to be Washington, D.C. And while I was there, an old friend who used to be at the CDC who'd gone to Health and Human Services asked me to give him a call if I was in town, so I did. So I came back from that trip, and Abraham Lincoln did this a lot. It was called the non Monday Lie. I called up the patient advocate that I'd been speaking to at Tucson Medical Center. And I said, I've been to Washington, D.C., and I've spoken to Health and Human Services. <laughs> when is this training on cognitive bias in medical diagnosis going to happen? I didn't tell a lie, but I certainly used my social psychology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it they scheduled it within half an hour. Wow. Wow. That is great. I have so much I want to ask you. What, and this, maybe this is too hard to answer in a couple of minutes. But B, if you look back on your academic career, would you change anything? Or maybe the version of that would be, what advice would you give the faculty if you did it all over again, would, would you do anything differently? Oh, goodness gracious sakes, alive. I love my projects. I love my students. I love my fellows, as they well know. It, more ways of keeping in touch. I think that's the only thing. And also more ways one of the hardest poems I had to write in that book, and I revised it, revised it, was something called A Quilt for Edna. Mm -hmm. She was my community guide to the Lower East Side. Some more ways of really honoring those people who are on the ground, whose hearts and souls really inform everything that we do. There are a couple of articles that I have written there's one called the white researcher in the multicultural community that get at that a little bit. I was finally able to write the Edna poem all the way. It took me years and years to write it and to get her husband's approval to publish it. And I would say that would be the one thing, more ways to honor and incorporate into our professional lives those community guides who my best ideas came from them mm. not from books and articles the kids told me when we did the the parent pre-adolescent training they said tell my parents not to bounce me around but to tell me that they care that's why there's all those rules mm. just flip it on to caring. There, there's something else that I've heard in your stories this afternoon, and I'm not so sure it's advice that you people can give one another, but I think it's a special trait or quality that you have, which is 
resilience, and maybe there's a different label for it. I think at the point of retirement or whatever we're going to call it, the death of a spouse is oh, not. debilitating to a lot of individuals, probably at any point in one's life and career. And that I think that could have certainly sideswiped an individual to just spiral into a depression and to not look to something like tango, for example, to lift you out and to celebrate life and love and your family. And so I think that, I mean, you don't need to hear this from me, but it's to your credit that you mourned and, and celebrated in a way that you didn't go down that spiral. I was very lucky that I was working at the hospice and the hospice had a grief program. I tried a couple of grief pro programs and the advice that you get of it's got to be the right time, it's got to be the right feel, and it's got to be the right people so that when it was the right time, I had the right people and I had the right format for me. Some people need individuals, some people need group, mm -hmm. et cetera. And I went through a guided grief process. And ages ago at Little College of New Rochelle, again, the connections in this world, one of my colleagues there was Ken Doka, who was an expert on un unacknowledged grief mm -hmm. and how you hold grief in your body, that someone who had a miscarriage might feel it all in their arms and shoulders as if they were holding a baby. Wow. And so... He had actually come to our project on the Lower East Side and done grief training for our outreach workers because they would run across things in the neighborhood that were just mm. uh, stunning. And so I went through this whole process of going to the grief groups and I had the joy not every marriage is perfect. Everybody has foibles. Herb knew mine forward and back. I knew his. But on the whole, it was a really good relationship and not everybody gets it. That's right. And before he died, I, I told the hospice physician, he gave me the greatest gift. And he said, oh, what did he give you? And it, it was a sentence. It was, you're going to be all right, aren't you, Denise? Because he wanted me to be all right. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I mean, you were something else. With all due respect, so are you. Yeah. <laughs> uh. I, 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 I will. I, I know it's, we've kept you with our launch about an hour, and I want to be respectful of that. I hear your stories, and I've read a little bit about you. Were there, I'm, I'm still in my career. Yinka's still in her career. You're not here to make me feel better, but did you have any failures? It sounds like you did everything perfect, and everything's been awesome, and you got every grant, worked with Don Campbell. Anything going on? Of course. Okay, thank you. You love to have that, Adam. That's okay. Yeah. Then there were articles that didn't get published that I really liked. But when my, my dissertation advisor was Sam Messick, who used to be vice president of educational test, testing service in a very good way. Man, was that guy philosophical. And he said, think of every failure as the mulch for the next project. So, and if you ever want to feel like you're not a success, try getting poetry published in, in journals, <laughs> in literary magazines. What's their rejection rate? Like 99.9%. .9%. It's easier to publish an American psychologist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, before this book, I, I, throughout my whole quote, poetry career, I had three poems published, period. So are you more proud of APA journal publications or poetry publications? I have to say right now, I'm proud of, I've got one publication 
that is on, on guidance for the World Health Organization. Anything that became policy, I'm extraordinarily proud of. I'm proud of that white researcher article because we really let it all hang out in that article. I want to do an article on the work you have to do to get into the community before you can even apply for a grant mm. and to gain trust and to find the right people to work with you. And I'm proud of that poetry book. And I don't know which poem is the cat's meow. I, Yinka, did any one of them hit you? Well, they're all just so amazing. I mean, I'm flipping through the book now. I, uh, gosh. And again, a lot of it is being open to accident. The poem about, about war. We were at brunch in the hotel there, and I heard somebody at the next table say the three R's of war, religion, resources, and revenge. And that became the poem. That's mm. pretty good. Mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. The three R's of war. So when's book two coming out? I'm working on it. Of course you are. <laughs> While she's yes. juggling all these other things. Yeah. And I have one poem I really like. It, it, it's called Critical Feeling, Final Exam. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And how many, do, do you have any tango videos of yourself up on YouTube? I don't have any up on YouTube. And I have one where my tango teacher talked me into um, doing a performance with another teacher at an event uh, to get more people interested in tango. But I don't know how to send it without going over the amount of K. But sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try and do it. But uh, I do know how to get you to Daniela Pucci and her husband and Diego and Anna dancing and they are a kick both of them i look forward to that b and so what let's say you've zip lined do you have any other bungee jumping skydiving anything of that uh, nature in your future no yeah in fact the younger grandson there was an opportunity to zip line over predators <laughs> and I said, no I, we're not doing that and his mother agreed with me <laughs> Very good. I'll, I'll stop here. Ian. I'm sorry. I don't think oh. I've been very polite to you. No, uh, I mean, I had a kick. It's, uh, it's just been amazing having me. But thank you absolutely. so much for being so willing to come and be part of this. And hopefully we'll maybe bring you back again. Oh, talk oh, about I, other aspects of your amazing, I, I would say I'm not gonna career, but I'm going to say you're on your ongoing adventures and exploits. I like that ongoing adventures. And who knows what's next? I just threw away all my fortune cookies, things that I've been keeping for years and years. I always keep the ones I like and throw out the ones I don't like. And I decided it's time for the clean slate and the new fortune cookies. Oh, I thought you were going to say it's time for me to start writing them <laughs> as the smallest poems ever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, that could be fun. That could be a lot of fun. Eric, food for your retirement? Food for my retirement, food for my dinner. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, this has been just a lot of fun. And y Yinka, I am so proud of you. I could burst. Thank you. Well, the last thing I'll say is what an incredible, giving, supportive mentor you've always been. And you've been such an incredible role model. Well, I think Thank the you. same with you. <laughs> so take care, everybody. You Thank you so much. Be well, be. Look forward to seeing you and talking with you and having you back soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.